There's a day that's drawing near when this darkness breaks to light and the shadows disappear. And my courage shall be my eyes. Jesus has opened down and the grave is open The victory is won. stand and we're going to sing when we walk with the Lord, trust and obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown nor a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, for we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go, never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. I come to the garden alone. While the dew is still on the roses, and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses, and He walks with me, and He talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. 
I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling. But he bids me go through the voice of woe, his voice to me, his calling. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known maybe seated When nature's walls surround me, the hills of green around me, my place in all creation seems so small. My song within me raises, my heart is filled with praises, for Lord, you are creator of it all. O oh Lord, our oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, our oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. With the dome of heaven above me, the crown of clouds above me, they sail across the deep and azure sky. From silent contemplation, I join with all creation, and from my soul the songs of praises fly. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We praise you as creator of it Lead us as we walk out our faith in a world full of darkness. 
Be with us as we explore your word this morning. Give us wisdom and understanding to chase after you, to be a light in the midst of darkness. Guide us and direct us, Lord, in your will. May it be done in our life and the life of this church. Amen. If you will, go ahead and turn in your bulletins. To, I mean, not bulletins. What are we doing here? Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. As we, t- as we talk about walking it out in unity. But as we think about this, uh, we think about this concept of walk. Uh, I, we're going to get there in a minute. But I, I want you to think about this concept of the turn. And many of y'all have, have grown up around this area. Many of you have probably watched a race or two in your life, and you understand uh, NASCAR is built on turns. Uh, that's what these drivers do is they drive around and they turn and they turn and they just keep turning for several hundred miles at a time or several hundred laps at a time. Turns are also part of horse racing. And then uh, several years back, uh, poker was a big thing televised. Uh, No Limit Hold'em, and there was a card in that series, it's called a turn card, and this concept of turn, it's a change in direction, it's a change in your focus, and Paul is making a turn here in chapter 4. He spent the first three chapters in in Ephesians talking about the church and the gospel as we dive, we took a deep dive into the gospel. We've been talking about who Christ is and what Christ did for us and the richness and the deepness of the gospel And now in chapter 4, he is making this turn to the church. He has solidified his theology. He has solidified his understanding of who Christ is. And now it is important for us, those people in in Ephesus as well as today's church, to be able to live this theology, this doctrine out in our lives. How do we walk out this understanding of Jesus as our Lord and Savior? That he has bestowed this grace upon us out of the limitless love of of his Father, and that should change our very being. It should shape and mold us and how we interact with the world around us. And so Paul calls us into action here, and walking is definitely an action. We talked about this this morning in Sunday school, that we must respond in action. We can't respond in apathy. We can't respond in just sitting around. The gospel should move us, and that's what Paul wants the church here at Ephesus to recognize, is that there is a response, and it must involve getting up and doing something. I know I've got several people in this church that enjoy walking, and they walk regularly as an as a form of exercise. And so let's jump in to the first verses in chapter 4 in Ephesus. It says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another, to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so we're really going to harp on over the next few weeks the unity within the church. And what does it look like for us as a body of believers, different backgrounds, different working uh, backgrounds and histories, different socioeconomic statuses, different ethnicities, different races, different upbringings. How do we come together as one body? For one reason, and that is to glorify God and to make his name known. It is something unique about the church, and Paul has talked about this mystery. The mystery of Gentiles being grafted into the family, that chosen race of Jews, to become one big family united by the love of God. And how do we do this? In a way that is meaningful and impactful and and done with a spirit of love. That is hard in this day and age because... There is so much division, but I want us to be challenged today as we think about this walk that Paul is talking about. And so, again, thinking about walking for us today, it's usually generally just a form of exercise. There are some people that walk primarily to get around, and we live, especially when I lived in Rougemont and in Bahama, you weren't walking anywhere. I wasn't walking to the store in Rougemont. The closest store was at least a five-minute drive. It would take me half the day to walk there and get what I needed and to get back home. It wasn't feasible for me to walk. Even in Bahama, it wasn't that feasible to walk. They closed the only quick stop down several years after we moved there. So if I was walking anywhere, it was maybe to Mangum or it was to a church. Those are the only things that were within walking distance of me in Bahama. Now it's changed a little bit since we moved to Durham. We are in a neighborhood that is a little bit more walkable. Harry did walk 
to Red and White the other day to pick up a few things. But in this day and age, and especially in our demographics of Northern Durham, walking isn't that important to us unless we do it for exercise. But in Jesus' day, walking was the prominent mode of transportation. As we see him and his disciples getting around, they're usually getting around by walking. They're not hopping on cars. They're not getting on the subway. They're not hailing an Uber. They're not doing any of those things because those things didn't take place there. We don't even really see Jesus and them being on animals and riding, which was one source of transportation. But in Jesus' day, it was almost always walking. You didn't even run in that day. It was almost unsightly for a Jewish man to run. We only see a few instances in Scripture where running is talked about. But you just didn't run. You mostly walked and occasionally rode an animal. So to, to Paul's audience here in Ephesus to walk out this faith, walk out this calling was very applicable because walking was such a prominent part of their life. And they knew if they were going to get anything done, they were going to go anywhere, they were going to work, if they were going to get anything, they were going to have to walk. And so Paul wanted them to understand that as they called themselves Christian, as they got to know who Jesus was, that walking was going to be involved. It was not something that they just said yes to and then rode a wave along. It was something that was tangible and had meaning behind it, and it required them to do something. And today, again, walking has very many different connotations. But Paul said, look, there is this, this walk that is specific to our understanding of who Jesus is, walking in a manner worthy of the calling for which you have been called to. As I was reading about this concept of walking and thinking about walking in our day and age, again, walking means a lot of different things to many different people. There's even psychologists that say, hey, look, we can determine your personality by watching how you walk. We can analyze your walk and tell you what type of person you are. Isn't that kind of crazy that we even look at our stride our posture, and the way we hold ourselves when we walk, and we think we can come up with something about ourselves. But there are many different ways of walking. You can fast walk. You can walk briskly. I've had conversations with Tom Eamon uh, over the, the past several months. He used to be a runner, and much like me, he had to have a hip replacement, and following a hip replacement, it is not recommended that you run. But he talked about brisk walking, in which you could walk at a pace in which your heart rate gets up, and you get exercise, but it's not quite running. There's also a slow, leisurely walk. When I went to East Carolina, I had to walk. Walking definitely took on a different understanding then because I had to walk everywhere. I had to walk to class every day. I had to walk to work. I could walk to where I live. And my mentality at college was if I was passing somebody as I was walking to class, I was walking too fast. I needed to keep a slow, leisurely walk. I there was no hurry to get anywhere. And so you could do a slow walk. You could also do a very chill walk. And if you go through parts of Durham, you can see different modes of walking. Sometimes you see people holding their pants up while they're walking or even having a little bit of a limp to their walk because they're just walking with a very chill attitude. And now with the dawn of phones and texting and watching videos, there's what I call distracted walking. I'm sure you could get on YouTube if you wanted to and you just look up distracted walking and there are videos of people literally looking at their phone and walking into fountains in the mall because they were not paying attention to what they were doing when they were walking. I see it all the time now, though. You go down the street and you see people walking and looking at their phones, not paying any attention to what they're doing. But Paul is not talking about any of these kinds of walking. Paul is talking about a unique walk, a walk that is centered on Christ, that is centered on our faith, that is centered on what is going on in our heart. And it's a unique calling. And he says, this is a calling that is worthy, worthy of recognizing Christ and the Spirit that dwells in you. And so he's saying, look, if y'all understand this gospel that I've been preaching to you over the last three chapters, if you understand Jesus Christ, you understand his sacrifice for you, and you recognize that when Jesus left, he said, there's going to be one that is going to come that is going to be greater than me that spirit that's going to dwell in all of you, that is going to stir greater works than what you have seen me do. If you recognize that spirit is living inside of you, then that spirit should motivate you to walk in a way that is worthy of having that spirit dwell within your heart. 
So we must walk like that spirit lives inside of us. That is a challenge for many of us to do that. In a world that is in, in temptation, it is often hard to walk with a spirit-filled walk. It is a struggle, but Paul coaches us here and says, look, this, this is what I want you to recognize, that this, this walk that we're doing together in unity by this spirit draws us together in that bond. He goes on in verse 3, it says, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Believers, we are united by this spirit. We may look different, we may talk different, we may come from different backgrounds, but in this spirit, we are bound together. And we must recognize that as we continue to take steps forward here at Bragtown, that we must be unified because of the spirit that dwells inside of us. And if you look at the top of your bulletin, you'll see the passage in Galatians. That is the fruit of the spirit. And all of us, all of us have these fruits within us. It's a matter of allowing the spirit to cultivate them. It took me a long time to recognize that as a Christian. I'd often pray for more patience or more faith. But we have the patience. We have the faith. We have the kindness. We have the gentleness. It's inside of us because the Spirit's inside of us. We must listen to that Spirit. We must let that Spirit cultivate those characteristics and qualities within us. And that's how the Spirit works in us. And that's how we walk out our faith is allowing the Spirit to cultivate those things within us. And as we understand this peace, this peace that Paul talks about, this bond of peace, we allow this peace to break Satan's stronghold on us. And it pushes back the division that often creeps into our lives. It's that sin nature within us. Satan, Satan is the deceiver. Satan is the divider. And Satan has done that over and over again within the church. We must recognize that and and rest in that bond of peace. As we rest in that Holy Spirit, it pushes back on that division that Satan is trying to cause within the church. And that is is so important for us here at Bragtown, to recognize that and that we want to live in that unity rather than division. And the church, again, has been a place of this division. And I don't know if y'all pay much attention to the news or what is even going on within the SBC right now. But it is important for us to recognize Satan's stronghold. There is so much division even within the SBC. I think over the past few years, we've seen a lot of division within the Methodist church. That was in the news big time several years ago. The Presbyterian church has dealt with their own set of division. And now, y'all, we must recognize too, as we walk with SBC and the Southern Baptists, that there is division within the SBC. Stay current in your understanding with that. Our executive committee chairperson just left. There has been strain and struggle over the issue of sexual assault within the SBC and whether we're going to cover up sexual abuse within the church. It is important for us to take a stand in unity and not let Satan get a stronghold within the church. We are not immune to it as a whole within the Baptist realm or within individual churches either. So think about that. Think about are we walking with this peace and not in division. And so Paul says, look, this is, this is how we walk this peace out. It is by this spirit. And these church at Ephesus, these church at Bragtown are some of the characteristics that Paul wants them to focus on. And it's humility, gentleness, patience, and then putting up with one another in love bearing with one another. And so the first thing is one of the hardest things for me to wrap my mind around and to let that ingrain in my heart, and that is humility. Humility must be a part of our lives in Christ. A phrase that I heard that Tim Keller said many years ago as I was teaching youth on humility, it has changed the way I think about humility. It says it's not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself. Y'all hear that? It's not thinking less of yourself, of yourself less. And as we wrap our minds around what that looks like, and that we are not the best or the end all, it is not about us, it is about other people. And we must recognize that as we think about humility. We must be ready to love others more than we love ourselves. 
And Paul, again, breaks this concept down magnificently in uh, Philippians chapter 2. So I encourage you if, you, if you have your Bibles out, to flip over to Philippians chapter 2. And I'm going to read the first eight verses. And it talks about humility, and it relates it back to Christ's walk as well. So chapter 2 in Philippians, verses 1 through 8 says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Listen to verse 3. This is one of the first verses I memorized because I knew in my heart that I was not a humble person. Do nothing with selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. Christ set the example for us. He was God, with God, with his Father, in perfect unity with the Trinity. And yet he said, no, I'm going to empty myself. I am going to count myself as nothing so I can give you everything. If he did not do that, we would have no chance at salvation, no chance at life. He ultimately paid the price that we could not pay. And I'm writing right now, I'm writing a theology, uh, a theological statement paper on these verses and how if we can base handling change and conflict in the church on these verses, things would not ever become so big that it would cause a church split and that the vision would rock the church. If we approach situations of change and conflict with an attitude of humility, an attitude of grace, if we recognize how much Christ sacrificed because he loved us more than he loved himself, we would start to look at people differently. We would handle conflict differently. We would handle change differently. And this is what Paul is reminding those at Ephesus, is that we must, we must approach our walk with humility. If we ever think that we're the one that matters most, then we're in a bad situation. If we think that our pride and our needs and our ego should trump everybody else's, then we're not doing the right thing. We must be willing to listen. We must be willing to lay down our desires and our preferences for the preferences of others. And Christ modeled that, and Paul often modeled that as well. And then he goes on. We must be gentle. We must have gentleness in our interactions with others. And I want you all to think about that. Do we handle each other with gentleness? Tone matters. Our approach matters. We must approach people with gentleness and with kindness, not in harshness and ridicule. Oftentimes in our culture, it is quick to get back at somebody, quick to fire off a statement that is hurtful, to use just even a harshness in our voice to get a point across. And yet Christ approaches people in gentleness. He approaches people in humility. And we must recognize that when we approach each other, we walk as Christ walked. And if we don't handle each other in gentleness, then what does the world think? We ought to be able to handle ourselves and our relationships in the church with gentleness, and even more so out in the world around us. And that's important for us to think about. Do we engage in gentleness with people in restaurants and in the gas station and in Walmart? And right now is a time of very big frustration. Lori and I were lamenting over the fact that there is short staff everywhere. And even when we went down to the Outer Banks, there was a sign that read, this is the new pandemic, short staffing. Please be patient with those that showed up for work today. Our gentleness is important when we interact with the world around us because people are hurting. People are going out on extreme measures right now in order to make life work. And if we, as Christians, can't approach them in gentleness, then we're not walking this walk out. And Paul, yes, Paul is talking about the church and how we handle each other, but it is 
oh so much more important, I believe, to handle the world with these kind of characteristics because we want the world to see what we have in Christ and we must walk that gentleness out in the world around us. And again, as we model Jesus' interaction, Jesus often handled people with compassion and approachability. Jesus was one that was easy to talk to. Think about his reaction or interaction with the woman at the well. He approached her with hospitality and with gentleness and was able to share the gospel with her. Jesus oftentimes was very approachable. Are we approachable because we are gentle? Or do we approach people in harshness and crassness in the world around us? That's give us the ability to be gentle. And then the one that was also a big struggle for me, Paul really cut deep in my heart this week. I'm telling y'all, the pastor is convicted just as much as I hope you were convicted by the Holy Spirit's moving because I needed to preach this to myself this week, especially about humility and about patience. I have, again, never been one of the most patient people, and I would often get mad when things did not go as my, as my plan, uh, as I thought my plan should be, especially when I was a teenager and a young adult. The King, the King James Version translates patient oftentimes as long-suffering. Long, that doesn't sound pleasant. Long-suffering? Does anybody want to suffer for a long time? Not me, but that's what often is patience. You want something, you want it done now, but it's not happening when you want it. It's long-suffering. And that word is always, as one of the words in the King James Version, I don't really use the King James Version, but that word and that translation has always stuck with me that that's what patience is, is long-suffering. We are called to be long-suffering in our interactions with each other. We are called to have patience with each other. And I tell you, marriage and having kids has taught me very much about patience. In a world as a young adult, life revolved around me, or at least I thought it did. And so when something didn't go my way, it was impacted just on me. And I, and I had a hard time accepting that. But man, the Lord has showed me through having a wife and now three kids that I must take into consideration that my patience has been tried on many days. Oftentimes, many mornings before I come to church, my patience has been tried. But it is good and the Lord is working and he is using that spirit to cultivate in me that understanding of patience. And, and even in this world that we live in, we are quickly losing the understanding of patience. We want things quickly. I've told you all about this. We, we, we want things now. And Amazon has ruined us, honestly, to get things in a few days and even a few hours now in some places in Durham. Karis and I was sitting down yesterday on the couch, and she has been bugging me to order her a ukulele. They've been playing ukuleles at school, and she wants a ukulele, and she's got some money in her savings account. She's like, Dad, let's go ahead and order it. I'm like, okay. Get on Amazon on my phone, and I find a ukulele that she wants, and I order it for her. And I was like, okay, it's done. It's ordered. She's like, when will it be here? I said, Wednesday. And I could immediately see a sense of the deject- rejection in her. I said, oh, Wednesday? I thought Amazon had two-day delivery. Wednesday's not two days. I want it now. That's not fast enough. I have to be patient. She has to be patient and know that it will come on Wednesday. But in the, I think back too about my childhood and I think about her expression of it coming on Wednesday. When I was growing up, you had to fill out the order form by hand. You had to put it in the mail. And I can remember order form saying two to three weeks for processing. Two to three weeks for processing? What do they have to process? It doesn't take that long to process. And then they've got to mail it back to me. You're talking about five weeks before I might get something that I ordered. That's just ridiculous. My kids don't understand in this world of technology and two-day delivery, patience is becoming something of yesteryear. But it is still important for us to think about, not just with what we order online or when our food gets to our table or when we have something done. We must recognize that patience is part of our walk with Christ. And as we look towards God for him to work and for him to do things that we want him to do, we must remember patience. Patience with the process and patience with God. A response that I often tell people when I'm talking about the church is that we all must have patience. The church doesn't work quick. The church is not nimble, I don't think, with layers of different committees and decision making. The church does not often move fast. That has become 
something of a frustration for me in my several years in ministry is wanting things to get done now, but it doesn't happen that way. And sometimes the church can also be impatient with just having things change. I want to remind us, though, that we are under the authorship and the lordship of God, and God is definitely not on our timetables. And part of the way God works is to cultivate that sense of patience within us. He has given us this spirit to cultivate these specific characteristics that he is going to work in and through life in order to get our attention and to grow these things. And so as we think about patience and we reflect on patience, we must recognize that God doesn't operate by our standards. God doesn't operate by our time. I have to remind myself frequently that time is not even really a concept to God. Time is a human construct. We put time on everything, but God is not bound by time. That is important to remember as we wait on God to work. I have seen God work already here at Bragtown, and I'm eager for him to continue to work more. And sometimes God doesn't work as fast as we want him to, but I guarantee you that he is at work, and I trust in that. And then lastly, Paul reminds us that we must bear one another in love. And like I said in my Eric Miller translation, putting up with each other. Putting up with each other is hard sometimes. Dealing with other people can be difficult. We all have our flaws. We all have our warts per se. And we must deal with each other. We must interact with each other. We must work with each other in order to continue to grow and thrive and move this church forward and proclaim the gospel. Oftentimes when I discuss with other people in ministry, as we lament oftentimes about things and struggles and trials that we have in ministry, I just kind of shrug my shoulders and say it's people. We work with people, plain and simple. And when we look at people, we are all sinful. We all have our flaws. We all have our faults. And we must deal with them. And Paul says that we must deal with each other in love. We are all sinners. We all have different views on everything. And it's hard to lay down our pride in the end. But yet, if we model ourselves after the love of Christ, if we love Christ with all of our heart, we understand that we're called to love each other with all of our heart, then love can bear all things. Scripture says love covers a multitude of sins. We must recognize that and live in that love. And even when we have difficulties with certain people, we must remember that we are all created in God's image. We're all called to his purpose. We must love one another as he loves us. Thank goodness Jesus didn't pick me or you or anybody else because of our characteristics or our personalities or our size or our, uh, the way we like things handled. No, he poured out his blood for each of us and all of us, and I'm very thankful for that. And as we move forward as a church and as we think about these characteristics and unity, how do we walk this out? And I encourage each of us to think about what we need to lay aside what we need to put on in order to grow and move this church forward. I'm going to end with this. I came across this as I was studying. I think this epitomizes what Paul is talking about. It says, in order to pursue these qualities, we must be willing to announce, renounce the opposite of each. We must renounce self-centeredness in order to walk in humility. We must renounce harshness in order to walk in gentleness. We must renounce the tyranny of our own agendas in order to walk with patience. We must renounce our idealistic expectations in order to walk in forbearing love. We must renounce indifference and passivity in order to be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. The church is unified and God is glorified when we live with such Christ-like conduct. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, man, it is such a privilege to be in your house, to know that by your grace we are saved, that we are filled as believers in the Holy Spirit because we put our faith and our trust in you. Continue to do your work in our lives, Lord. Continue to work within this body of believers. Unify us by the gospel and your call to go and to make disciples, to evangelize the lost, to live worthy of the calling that we have been given. Let us walk worthy, God, worthy of, of calling ourselves a Christian.
Help us to remember the magnitude and the power behind that title. Help us to be different. As you set apart the Jews in the Old Testament, you now have set us apart in your kingdom. We are light, walking in the midst of darkness. Help us to shine like a city on a hill that others may see your good works and give you glory. May we be a church that is spirit-focused, spirit-centered, driven by your mission for the world around us. In your name I pray, amen. Again, church, as always, the altar's open. Let the Spirit cultivate your hearts in a time of worship through song and a time of prayer. If you need to pray, pray where you're at. If you want to come down and pray with me, I'm always welcome to pray for with you and for you. God wants to hear our hearts. God wants to continue to do the work in us that he has already started in each of you. Allow him to do that. Let's stand. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. Before our fathers broke, we pour our other prayers. Our fears, our hopes, our sins, our wants. Our cup, our sadness, our cares. When we asunder part, it gives us inward pain. But we shall still be joined in heart and hope to make it Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred 